I met the fifth person who is absolutely crucial in the sound that we make. And that's the guy that makes these wonderful instruments here, David Odom. Um, he's a classic Exeter bloke. You know, he goes to his shed at the top of his garden in Whipton, and out of his shed, these amazing instruments. He died last year at the age of 86. But if you want to know a little portrait of David, it's like, this bastard cold in there, I was down there trying to fill me up again, and I said, but they're dropping off in the morning, but it didn't turn up. Anyway, so I waited there, and buddy Godfather just came by, and then after that, and then buddy pissed me up. He's a bit like that. <laughs> he's, a, sorry about that. He's, he's a bit blunt. David, he's a proper sort of working class extra a guy, and uh, he, he came to one of our gigs once, a huge gig at the Great Hall. I said, did you enjoy it? He said, perfectly honest, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the thing is, I don't mind Phil's fiddling, but your songs can be dreary. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you can come by tomorrow, but I shan't be there. <laughs> I've got to take her to the fucking hairdressers. <laughs> Girl ask goes every fucking week. It always looks like insane. <laughs> anyway, that's David. <laughs> Absolutely. He worked for the post office all of his uh, working life and then developed this gift for making these wonderful instruments. And he was very, very impatient with people that got very, very precious. Um, I am as well. I, I don't regard this as an art. I think it's a craft, you know. People that regard themselves as artists tend to want to excuse bad behaviour and being late, you know. <laughs> I think this is a craft, storytelling. I think it's, it's healthier to look at it like that. Someone can look back at the life of a musician and say that was an artist at work, but I would never say that about myself. I'm very uncomfortable about using that expression. So David made these instruments. For him, it's just a bit of wood with wires on, you know. <laughs> it's not a work of art, it's just a tool, it's an artefact. I mean, it's a beautiful artefact, but uh, the guy brought one of these. <laughs> he, he took it back after a year. He said, Dave, doesn't sound like it does when Steve Knightley and Phil Beer play. <laughs> well, that's because they're fucking professionals and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I'd been there. <laughs> that moment of realisation. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Another guy took a guitar back and said that so every time I play that note, David rattles. David said, well, don't well play it then. <laughs> I love, it's so refreshing, you know, in the world of self-indulgence to hear that sort of attitude, you know. So what I thought I'd do is... Um, if you're looking about all the influences that go into writing the song, you know, the Carthy and the, the Ted Hughes and, and, and the Bob Dylans and, and the bloke in gospel, I thought, I'd, um, I thought I'd play a song on all four of these instruments. You know, I'd get better line them up. I'll start off on the quattro, then I'll go to the tenor guitar, then I'll go to the guitar. It gets a bit tense this sometimes. And then I'll go to the cello mandolin. And you can hear the way that... There's a, a source of ideas and atmosphere through writing. It's nice to have these other voices. This is a new song of mine. It's, um, it's called Make the Right Noises. It, in some ways, it's, it's quite a bit, uh, you know, I don't know why Sarah left me. It's a bit like that, but <laughs> it's the emotional landscape. But um, it's that situation where you just want someone to go through the, just to go through the motions of saying, you know, being affectionate. And you know, sort of, in a way, it's long past that. So I'll start off with a quattro. You say one thing, but I hear another. When you write friends, then I read lover. When you hold all the cards, you can make the choices. But say Then 
If you're 